AEW Wrestle Dream. This was a show to commemorate the life of Antonio Inoki. He passed away one year ago today, and it was stacked. You know, like it wasn't last year's All Out type stacked, but there was a lot of stars on here, and it was a good show. So I don't want to waste time. Let's get into it. The first match on the show was a handicap match for the ROH World Tag Team Championships. MJF defended the gold against the righteous Vincent and Dutch. Adam Cole was out with an injury. It's unfortunate that he suffered a foot injury during this story of all stories. But MJF though was a loyal competitor and was going to fight in honor of his best friend. They didn't cause too much trouble for him and by the end of it he was a man of his word. He said he was going to shut them up and body slam Dutch. He did just that. Pissed them off in the process. Not a noteworthy match. They weren't even trying to make it a noteworthy match. It was all about MJF just strolling through the competition. And if the job was to portray him as this super intelligent individual who can overcome tough challenges, especially a two on one, then they did a good job because the crowd loved him. I'm pretty interested in seeing who he's going to defend the title against next. Adam Cole's of course injured, they can't really do that straight at the moment. Nor do I think they were going to do it in the first place. But there's a couple of other guys they could go with, but we'll see. Okay, the next match is the ROH World Championship and the Strong Openweight Championship. Eddie Kingston defended the titles against Katsuyori Shibata. For somebody that had been away for almost six years, Shibata's wild been recently. Good match, both men were very aggressive and intense. Kingston's got a lot of respect for Japanese wrestling, it's seen inside and outside the ring, so for him to face an icon like Katsuyori Shibata must have been a dream come true. This match was tight, it was packed with action, and I had plenty of praises for Shibata. Nobody expected him to return from the career-ending injury, yet not only was he back, he was wrestling in the US and in the second biggest promotion against some of the very best talent. There was zero doubts about the quality of the match. The one thing I liked is that they didn't need 20 minutes to put on a match like this, it took only 10. Rough action, but I'm sure they wouldn't like it any other way, and for Kingston, yet another victory over a Japanese wrestler. They finally booked him to win the big one, kind of the big one, the ROH World Championship, and things actually look positive for him from a result standpoint, because while he's been doing good in the last two years here and there, he was losing the big matches, he was always bottling it when it mattered most. That's changed recently, we'll see how his title ring goes from here on. The next match is the TBS Championship. Chris Statlander defended the title against Julia Hart. Anytime I see the woman nowadays on pay-per-view, they have this hunger and eagerness to make the most out of their opportunities. This match was no different. Julia Hart, despite being the underdog, was portrayed to be a fighting pit bull who would stop at nothing to score the victory. Her offense was very aggressive and to the point. She was backing up that fury she had shown in the last year and a half. She was going for all kinds of things and was in control for a portion of the match. She took advantage of Brody King's distraction at one point and went to work. Match gets heated back and forth and Statlander's big match experience shows here as she steers clear of Julia Hart. Pretty good match, the only problem is again, these women title matches don't feel notable. Like they're good. I'm not gonna say they're bad, they're actually good. They're an improvement over the last year I'd say. It's just they need to feel more important. Statlander needs more credible opponents, especially on pay-per-view, but Julia Hart did a great job here. This was probably her very best match in AEW. He's got a good future ahead as does Chris Stanland. The next match is a fatal four-way tag team match with the winner getting an AEW World Tag Team Championship match. The Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson, Lucha Brothers, Penta, El Zero Miedo, and Ray Phoenix, The Guns, Austin and Colton, and Orange Cassidy and Hook. These are the four teams. You guys know how this went. Flippy stuff all over the place with four teams out there. The match never got dull. But unfortunately though, Ray Phoenix had a little moment. He suffered an injury and was taken to the back. Other than that, I don't really have much to say about this match. The Young Bucks win, of course. I mean, when you see full gear is in LA and the fact that FTR's first match with the Bucks was at that very same event, why don't they run it back? I think everyone knew the result regardless of that FTR thing. I just couldn't see the Bucks losing here even though it would have been fresh. I would have been interested in seeing the Lucha Brothers running it back with the FTR once again. Orange Cassidy and Hook's a new tag team, you know. I know FTR faced Lucha Brothers before, but I'd say it's a bit fresh when compared to the Young Bucks who just faced them a month earlier. The next match is between Swerve Strickland and Hangman Adam Page. Swerve makes a homecoming to his home state. This is basically one of his first big tests. Hangman Adam Page is like the gateway to the very top of AEW. He's been up there and most likely will be up there for the entire time and naturally you need new talent to climb the ranks. And Swerve Strickland's case is very welcoming. He could talk, he could wrestle, not to mention has this aura surrounding him. If anything, I almost find it strange they never pushed him harder earlier on. He's got his own faction now, he's solo and he's flying high. Prince Nana on the side got this goofy dance that's connecting with the fans. It's some silly stuff, but about the match, Swerf passes the test. Good action. Funny enough, Hangman was booed, which is of course because they're in Seattle. Hangman's arm was targeted throughout the match with Swerf making it a priority, and on the other side, Hangman was going after Swerf's hand. The match kicked up a notch, and that intelligence Swerf was well known for was shown here. Hangman had him with a bug shot, but Prince Nana save led to a moment of genius from the heel who used the weapon to drop Hangman and score the victory. Great stuff, I love the way they're going with Swerf Strickland, he's got the potential to be a major player for them and some much needed fresh talent because at the end of the day, AEW needs new guys for variety at the top. They got MJF now, he came in a year ago, he won the belt, 
He's doing very well. I'm very interested in seeing Swerve Strickland climb up a level and go to the very top. Because I feel like he will prosper. He will do very well in the main event scene. Okay, the next match was between Ricky Starks and Wheeler Yuta. Starks is on his piss off the members of the BCC tour. And next up is Wheeler Yuta. John Moxley is on commentary for this one. And again, I say it all the time. But there's always one match on the card that belongs on Dynamite. Our collision. This is that match. Wheeler Yuta was never going to win this match. Starks needs some hype and momentum again, which he already has. He's done some great stuff with Brian Danielson, but both of those matches were losses. As for this one, it was one of the weakest matches on the show, but that's not saying much. Like, it, it's solid stuff. Stark wins it here. Mox on commentary is pretty entertaining, but he'd really show a lot more during the next match. All right, with that said, the next match was between Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. The match that should have happened at Forbidden Door last week. What the hell? last year so you guys know brian and saber jr are the greatest technical wrestlers out there and the expectation for this match was high it was very high but i'd say they made good on it i think compared to kazuchika okada and brian danielson this match exceeded its expectations it was the best kind of technical wrestling like the psychology was insane and sublime what i liked most was how both men had such a huge ego to prove that they are the best technical wrestler and refused to deviate away from it because by doing so they basically forfeit that moniker it felt hard hitting great selling from both men i liked how they were all in on the technical style it was scientific wrestling to the core limb targeting strikes everything was aggressive and rough and the ending left an opening because when you go back to that topic of the best technical wrestler brian technically deviated away from it to score the victory nigel mcginnis complained about this on commentary as well there's a couple of brutal moments throughout the match such as saber jr's ankle looking like it was destroyed and it was rough stuff it opens the door for a rematch especially after zach saber jr refused to shake brian's hand it's a very psychology sound match like it's very ideal and specifically what you would expect from these two they had great intentions the pacing was well done and about the result i mean brian's on home turf he was obviously gonna win but yeah i expect a rematch between these two in the future because this was some amazing stuff it was great match of the night okay the next match is a trio's tag team match kenny omega chris jericho and kota ibushi faced the don Kells family sammy guevara will osprey and konosuke takeshita a lot's been happening recently sammy guevara has been all over the place in the last year and a half and for some reason he couldn't find something to stick with which i find strange because he was doing perfectly well before him. nowadays it feels like once everyone hated him last year it's stuck and not for good reason like people don't enjoy his promos and sometimes even his matches because he doesn't sell well he just turned on his guy chris jericho to join don Callis. i don't really know what to make out of it at the moment but one thing for sure is that the talent disparity between himself and the other two is pretty damn far and personally i think it's unfortunate because i feel he has the capabilities to be much more than he is right now as for the match itself it was good but there's some flaws and mistakes at one point guevara messed up the springboard uh, cutter which i think is unfortunate it looked like a good spot but i think omega was a bit too far out it was strange chris jericho once again puts in a performance which is funny you know i was wrong about him man is not close to being finished not at all and he's 53 everyone else for the most part were great it's just he stood out to me more because he was in the same ring as will osprey Takeshita, omega and kota ibushi i kind of expected the faces to win it here but sammy guevara actually pinned jericho after he was blasted with a baseball bat i'm sure that story will develop since jericho has problems with both him and Kalis. as for omega and Takeshita, i still think it will end with kenny overcoming his ex-friend and manager that's the way it's gonna go osprey is still world class just another day for him man good stuff it was enjoyable but as i said there were some mistakes here and there the mistake that stands out to me was of course the sammy guevara cutter it was a bit too far out which was strange he caught me off guard I was like what the hell but it is what it is okay the next match was the aew world tag team championships ftr defended the gold against aussie open these two teams were in a tough position the crowd was a bit off here and that's compared to the other aew crowd seattle it just didn't hit as hard so this forced both teams to go all out and try to get them interested it worked ftr has always been doing great work on pay-per-view aussie open usually featured on the zero hour shows so this was a nice upgrade and the match had a lot going against it but in a vacuum great stuff i just wasn't as interested in it because of the fact that the show was so long like aew's got these shows they always go so damn long which i'm assuming is because they're trying to get your money's worth you know but if they ever revert to a monthly pay-per-view thing like i personally think they should go for three hours but it is what it is ftr retained the title here they got the respect from the fans and i guess they're gonna move on to face the young bucks at full gear so we'll see okay in the main event christian cage defended the tnt championship against darby allen and a two out of three falls match captain charisma has been wilding on aew and has been one of the most if not the most consistent character over the last few months every time people talk about aew's best characters recently they mention mjf and then christian cage why because he's well-rounded this man has a sharp tongue preys on fatherless wrestlers and provides a level of entertainment you have recently even his look with the damn turtleneck is funny darby's back in his hometown he's without sting and nick wayne who was sent to the back 
but his mother though was watching in the crowd. The first fall saw Christian get caught off guard, he lost it, and then the second fall was mostly sidetracked, staring at Wayne's mother. He got this funny ass bump all distracted and even delusionally thought she was interested in him, and this is why I love Christian, his stories are goofy, yet at the same time, very serious. He's one of the only guys that makes it work. Darby though, ended up getting annihilated. This man loves pain, and if this was another era, he'd be doing half of Mick Foley's spots. All for no real reason. And Christian looked very vile. He got the fall and started tearing apart the ring. He was doing everything he could to take out Darby, who ironically got more resilient as time went on. And out of everybody to save him, it was Nick Wayne, the same man who was trashed for having no father by Christian, and what I liked about this heel turn is the fact that he wasn't entirely convinced of his decision. His mother was upset, and Christian scored the victory. Great match, bit too long, but Christian looked amazing here. He's a multifaceted heel, and at his best, he's a master manipulator trying to be the father figure that Nick Wayne lacked. I still want to see that Christian Cage AEW World title run, but hey, it doesn't really matter because he's doing his best work, and in addition, main eventing shows. The heels attacked after the match, leading to Sting coming out. The numbers got to him though, and a concerto was set up. All of a sudden, the lights go out, somebody's being hyped up, and everyone knew who it was. But then you hear Metalingus, and it's Edge. Adam Copeland was all elite, and I'm not gonna lie, this man looked so out of place here, I can't explain it, his presence in AEW was so strange, it's like placing John Cena or Randy Orton here, he teased siding with Christian before taking out his guys and standing tall, man, this was wild, one of the more wild AEW moments, if you read the dirt sheets recently or been on Twitter, you weren't gonna escape the rumors of Edge returning or debut, returning, what the hell am I saying, Edge debuting in AEW, it was expected, but to actually see it go down is weird, I just didn't really imagine it like you hear tony shivani and taz talking they're hyping him up they even called him the rated r superstar i'm like what the hell is this but yeah edge is all elite now he's even got the rated r moniker he's got his wwe theme song which is so synonymous with him so it's expected that AEW would want to try and get it but looking at it from his perspective this is a logical decision because you don't really know what wwe is going to do in the next couple of years they might bump his contract they might even release him so going to AEW, trying to give him a shot in the arm or more interest it makes sense they probably offered him a hell of a lot of money i don't know how much they offered him but i'm pretty certain it's more than what wwe did so it made sense for him to go to aew he's got a lot of fresh opponents but at the same time he could rekindle some other feuds you know brian danielson christian of course he could also team up with the likes of sting which is weird but yeah he's got a lot of stuff he could do in aew all right that's aew wrestle dream good show it went too long though but that's always a complaint of mine for these uh, shows it's probably not gonna stop anytime soon although i prefer if it did i do get why they do it you know trying to get your money's worth you know they're trying to maximize the show it's just it kind of ruins the flow of it you know if you cut some other matches from here the show would be looked at a lot better that's what I'm trying to say. But yeah, I enjoyed the show. It was good. Match of the night is definitely Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. Those two put on a technical clinic. It was some world-class stuff. These guys showed everybody how to do it. There's not many out there in the world right now that could do it like Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. Amazing stuff. Edge's debut in AEW. As I said, it's weird, but I'm interested. And the only reason why it's weird is because he looks so out of place. But yeah. Good show, I enjoyed. Alright, what did you guys think of AEW Wrestle Dream? Please comment down below on that first video. Make sure you hit the knee on the like button and perhaps the spear on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm at.